السلام عليك زين الأنبياء السلام على بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأفضل الصلاة وأتم تسليم على سيدنا ومولانا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم أجمعين الحمد لله this is the third day that we have observed this fast and inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bless us to continue to worship in a way pleasing to him in this blessed month of Ramadan. We will continue on in our study of the book of the Ihyalum al the book Kitab Tilawat al-Qur'an on the proprieties of how to recite Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book with the intention of increasing our relationship with his book, with the Qur'an. And before I get into the outward etiquettes that Imam Wazali offers, I want to quote one very beautiful statement of Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, and it dovetails very nicely into what we just heard from Ustad Amjad about the merit of the Qur'an and its virtues. And in this statement, he indicates how the person who is learning the Qur'an and literally is carrying the Qur'an, i.e. the one who has memorized it, should be. And we can extrapolate this meaning to understand that anyone that takes the Qur'anic message seriously, there are signs of this, and this is reflected on various traits they have and how they act. And so Ibn Mas'ud said, يَنْبَغِ لِي حَامِلِ الْقُرْآنِ أَنْ so the one who has memorized the Qur'an should be known to do what? And يُعْرَفْ بِلَيْلِهِ إِذَا النَّاسِ يَنَامُونَ He's known by how he is at night when other people are sleeping. وَبِنَهَادِهِ إِذَا النَّاسِ يُفْتِرُونَ And how he is by day while people are breaking their fasts. I.e. he is someone that prays at night and is someone who fasts regularly during the day. And in relation to his grief internally out of concern for humanity in people, when people outwardly are just constantly in a state of worldly joy, exulting oftentimes in worldly things. The one who takes the Quranic message seriously is different. They will resemble the Prophet who was mutawasil al ahzan. He was constantly in a state of concern. And you can even say sadness internally over the condition of people, over the suffering of people, over wanting good for people in this world and primarily in the next. He's known by his uh, weeping and how he cries when other people are laughing. He's someone who cries abundantly. And the... One of the greatest signs of a soft heart is that tears flow from our eyes. One of the greatest signs of a hard heart is that we never shed a tear. So this is the way that people that have been affected by the book of Allah Ta'ala should be. You find them very quick to weep. And for those that have spent time in the Muslim world and around righteous people, know this to be the case of so many of the pious. They cry so quickly. You mention the Prophet in with some of them and they just start weeping. You mention a powerful story and all of a sudden you find one of them weeping. Something that we need to take a lesson from, they've applied it and looked into their own selves and they all of a sudden start weeping. These people are living this deen. And this is the way that the Qur'an recited and the one who has embraced the message of the Qur'an should be. وَبِي صَمْتِهِ إِذَا النَّاسِ يَخُولُونَ he should be known by his silence when people are delving into a whole bunch of different things. Man samata najah, our Prophet said, وسلم, whoever is silent will be safe, i.e., there's salvation in silence. He's known by his state of fear, this reverential awe that is very deep in his heart, in the stillness that is on his limbs, as other people might tread the earth arrogantly and walk with a strut and in a certain way. They carry themselves in a very different way, with dignity, 
وقار and with sakina and tranquility. وينبغي لحامل القرآن أن يكون سكيتا لينا. The one who has memorized the Quran, who is bearing Allah's book, is that they should remain silent often, but they should also be layinan. They should also be soft. What a beautiful word. ولا ينبغي. And there's certain ways that they shouldn't be. And يكون جافيان. They shouldn't be coarse and hard. ولا مماريان. Quick to quarrel. ولا سياحن. They shouldn't raise their voice and scream. ولا سخابن. Nor should they shout. ولا حديدن. Nor should they be in relation to their temperament. Quick to anger and snap on people and things of this nature. These are all signs that someone has embraced the message of the Quran and especially the Quran reciter. And we should always hold those who recite, who've memorized Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book in high regard. And there is abundant merit in doing so. And through the efforts of these many, many people, through these thousands upon thousands and thousands of people who have memorized Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala book, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book, that this is one of the main ways that the Quran is preserved. So inshallah, let's now uh, turn to uh, the second chapter of this book of the Ihya, uh, which is going to speak about the adab tilawa al zahira Zahir adab tilawa What are the outward etiquettes of recitation of the Quran? And he says that there are ten. So we will walk through these, bi ta'ala. So the first is, fi hal al qara in relation to the state of the one reciting Quran. And in order for us to really receive the fruit of recitation of Qur'an, we have to follow these etiquettes. Of course, there are things that are an obligation, i.e. that we have to be in a state of greater ritual purity. So if you've moved into a state of greater ritual impurity, you have to take a ghusl in order to purify yourself to even recite Allah Ta'ala's book. If you're in a state of janaba, greater ritual impurity, you can't recite Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala's book. So you have to take a ghusl, a purificatory bath, and then you can recite. And then it's recommended though to be in a state of wudu, even if you are reciting Allah subhanahu wa book, as we will see. And of course to hold the mushaf, i.e. the copy of the Qur'an, in order to hold it, you should make sure that you're in a state of wudu. And these days when many of us are at home, when we have a child, for instance, bring a copy of the Qur'an to us, we should also make sure that they're in a state of wudu. And we should not let a child that is young, i.e. lesser than what they call the age of discrimination. So three, four years old, they don't give a specific age for it, but sometimes five and even as old as six, we need to make sure that they don't handle the Book of Allah because we don't know how it is that they're going to treat it. And once they get a little bit older, then they're able to bring you a mushaf. However, they need to also be in a state of wudu. That's an obligation. But what we're talking about here are some of the etiquettes. So the first is, وَهُوَ إِنْ يُكُونَ عَلَى wudu That someone be in a state of purification. They be in a purified state. And what is meant here is that they have, should have lifted their ritual impurity and to be in a state of wudu. And wudu is one of the great blessings of the Ummah of our Prophet ﷺ. And it has a very profound spiritual and even psychological and physical impact upon us. We're going to be very clean, of course, if we're always washing ourselves. But there are many other wisdoms as well that are very powerful and very amazing. And what wudu is a protection. It's one of the great ways that we can protect ourselves from all of the hidden evil that you and I do not see. It is the silah of the believer. It is like having arms in a shield, whereby which that we can ward off harm from ourselves. And the word will do in the Arabic language comes from wada'a, which is radiance. And the radiance then from placing that water on the limbs is what the Prophet ﷺ will see on the Day of Judgment and it will be how he knows his Ummah. 
the traces of where we made wudu will be luminous and they'll be shining and radiant in the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi will know they are part of his Ummah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So it's always good to be in a state of wudu, but especially when we recite Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala's book. And then, waqifan ala hayat al-adabi wa sukut And literally, waqifan means to stand, but whatever position that we're in, as he's going to explain, we do so, your hayat is the way that you are, how you are outwardly, with adab in sukun. So it should, we should be sitting in a way, or standing in a way, that there is, in the way that we're sitting and standing, there's adab. And because so many of us have gotten so used to sedentary lives, and it's always amazing how advanced in some ways we are in the modern world, but how backwards we are in others. Many of us don't even have the ability to sit on the ground anymore. Many of us don't even know how to have proper posture anymore as a result of our sedentary lives, not exercising enough, the muscles in our back aren't strong, we're not used to ever sitting without something holding up our back, and so our posture is wrong, and then we develop back problems as a result, and then it gets very complicated and all of these other types of things. And all of this, when you sit properly, and when you sit upright, and you have your center of gravity in the right way, and you actually sit with a personal trainer that knows a little bit about this, and you sit in the proper way, one of the things that you'll find is it helps ward off laziness, helps ward off yawning, just by sitting outwardly with adab in a proper way so that it's good for you physically. It will also, it's also a part of adab, and it will help you concentrate more when you recite Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book. So if you're in a chair, the same thing applies. You should sit in a way where your back is straight and you are giving your full attention to what it is that you are doing. And if you sit sluggishly and you slouch, that will affect the way that you recite as well. And sukun, you should be still. This is one of the things that you and I need to learn. This is one of the things the greatest things that we can actually bring to the modern world, sukun, stillness. The modern world is moving so quickly. People are so busy. We don't take time to rest. Everything needs to rest. Now as we transition in North America at least into spring, and it's now April and it's been planting season for some localities, for others it's coming very soon. You can't plant the seeds for what you hope to grow that year unless you let the earth rest for the months that have just passed. The earth has to rest. Your body has to rest. There's a secret in this. And these busy lives that we live, unfortunately, don't allow us to rest in the way that we need to rest. And then there's less blessing when we actually do rest. And then the problem is compounded. Now, he's not talking about rest here, but it's from the same word, sukun. But you and I need to learn how to be still. We need to learn how to be still. And we should strive to sit still. And if we can't sit cross-legged to recite a juz of the Qur'an that might take us 25, 30, or maybe a little bit longer, maybe 40 minutes, then we really need to work on ourselves. We need to start stretching. We need to start struggling with ourselves so that we're able to sit quietly without flinching and without scratching and without itching and all these other types of things that you normally see younger kids do because they're young. This is their kids and they'll have to learn it as they get older. But adults, there's no excuse. I've been in gatherings where I've seen my teachers sit in the same position and maybe not even change legs for two, three hours. Where you and I, it gets more than 10 minutes, right? and oftentimes we have to keep videos short and lessons short because people's attention span. And nowadays, with all these analytics uh, on the back end, you can tell how much time actually people spend watching something. And if it's anything more than a minute or two minutes, it's like I'm out, and they check out, and they go to something else. Now, if we, that there's nothing wrong with watching shorter videos, 
but we should accustom ourselves if we want to grow spiritually to being able to listen to an extended discourse that might take some time to fully roll out. So that we want our outward state to be one of sukun. We have to sit with etiquette and we're still. So whether we are qa'iman or jadisan, so we could be standing when we recite or we might be sitting. We should also be mustaqbil al-qibla. So everything mentioned here is a part of this first series of etiquettes. It's about the hal of the qarit, the state outwardly of the one reciting. We should be facing the qibla. And look how practical this is. You can bring this directly into your life. Try to always, when you recite Allah Ta'ala's book, to be facing the qibla. And there might be some exceptions if you're in a group with other people and things like that. But we should all try to have a musalla at home. If you have an extra room, turn it into a musalla. And a library and a musalla, for instance. And if you don't have an extra room, make a portion of one of your rooms a musalla. And when you set up your desk at home, try to always face the qibla. There'll be immense barakah in that. And I remember years and years ago reading Ta'lim al by Imam Zanuji. And there were two students that started studying around the same time. And they outwardly seemed to be similar. But one of them really surpassed the other. And one of the shuyukh said, perhaps that was partially due to whenever he studied, he always faced the qibla. So we should always try to face the qibla, the direction of prayer. And the qibla is the direction of prayer that was gifted to our Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is that we see that you looking up into heaven indeed that we will direct you towards a qibla that you are content with and this is facing the Kaaba and Musharrafa and by doing so outwardly aligning ourselves in our way in that way we're aligning ourselves inward to be able to receive blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, facing the qibla. And then he says, Mutriqan ra'sahu. If you can, your head should be looking down. Your head should be looking down. And I also uh, highly encourage everyone to invest in some type of Quran stand. Um, I recently just bought a really neat one from Etsy. The online website, someone pointed me to that website, I wasn't familiar with it. And there was this really beautiful Turkish piece that you can adjust and it keeps it a little bit higher and you can actually put it just as you want it. Um, if not, some other type of Quran stands, some of those uh, that are too far to the ground is going to be kind of hard for you to turn the pages and read it. I would find something that puts the Mus'haf in a way that's easy for you to read. And what that will enable you to do is to do exactly what Imam Ghazali is saying. You'll have proper adab in terms of turning the pages. It's lifted off the ground. It's not on your lap or anything like that. And you're able to put that into practice where you can put your head down and read from it. Mutrikan ra'sahu ghayr mutarabbi'in wa la muttaqiyin wa la jalisin ala hayat al takabur So he mentions ways that we should actually not sit. And previously... And mutarabba is actually to sit cross-legged as I mentioned. And that really actually is a dispensation. What Imam Wazadi is suggesting is that we actually uh, sit on our legs as such. So it's hard to demonstrate right now. But not where we sit cross-legged, where we're actually like sitting on both of our legs back like that. That is what he's suggesting. And that we actually should not sit cross-legged. Which is also the way that people used to sit in class traditionally. Now the scholars at the, in the later period realized people's weakness, so they tolerated them sitting cross-legged. But we definitely shouldn't be leaning. Okay, And yes, Allah Ta'ala has praised those in the Qur'an, those who remember Him while they're leaning down. And in certain cultures that you find them doing this. Uh, and in some cultures and places I study, you find them doing this. So let's put everything in its proper place. Uh, some cultures, this is a part of their culture, but in general, it's ideal to sit in the way that he's uh, describing it. And if at other times, and as someone gets older and something like that, something changes, they don't have the strength that they had before, 
we have to be tolerant and to understand how this all relates to different people in different places. Now, and he said, nor shall we be sitting in an arrogant way. Okay, and that, that there's a number of different ways that this could be the case. Now, and so even when he's alone, you should sit the way you would sit before one of your teachers. Because you're sitting to read the book of Allah. And you can use that outwardly to remind you, how would I sit in before one of my teachers? Oh, that's the adab that I should have, and this is how I want to sit before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No. And then he says, and The very best state of all is to read Allah Ta'ala's book standing in prayer. When you kun fin masjid, even better than that is that that's done in a mosque. This is from the greatest acts of all. So when we hear things like this, we might not be able to do this every day or even regularly. We should at least try to do that once in our life. Or sometimes in our life. Or at least when we do like Umrah or Hajj, take that opportunity to do it. But we as believers should have our hearts attached to the Masajid. And the fact now that so many of the Masajid are closed and that we don't have access to them, this should rip us into shreds internally. Because we should love the Masjid so much is that whenever it is that we are away from it, we want to be back in it. And we should take glad tidings that this is one of the seven people that our Prophet taught us وسلم, will be under the shade of the throne of Allah on Yom Al-Qiyamah. is the one whose heart is attached to the masjid. And this has to be at the forefront of our minds in relation to our religious practice. So at least once let's do this, but let's try from time to time as well. Standing in prayer, reciting the book of Allah Ta'ala in a masjid. فَإِنْ قَرَأَ عَلَى غَيْرِ وَدُوْ وَكَانَ مُطَّجِعًا فِي فَرَاشْ فَلَهُ أَيْضًا فَضْرٌ وَلَكَنْ دُونَ ذَلِكَ So if someone recites Allah's book, even if they don't have the wudu, obviously not carrying a mushaf, a copy of the Qur'an, and they're laying down on their bed, there's still merit in that. وَلَكَنْ دُونَ ذَلِكَ But it's not as great in reward as the previous state that he mentioned. Because he then quotes the verse, that was mentioned, الَّذِينَ يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَقَعُودًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ In Surah Ali Imran, those who remember Allah standing, sitting, and on their sides. فَأَثْنَ عَلَى الْكُلْ Allah has praised all of them. وَلَكِنْ قَدَّمَ الْقِيَامِ فِي الذِّكْرِ But Allah Ta'ala mentioned first those standing. ثُمَّ الْقُعُودِ And then sitting. ثُمَّ ذِكْرِ مُتَّجِعًا And then those remembering laying down. So the fact that it was mentioned in that order in the ayah indicated the first is the greatest, the second is next best, and the third is the least great of the three, but they're all good. And then he quotes Sayyidina Ali bin Abi Talib as saying, مَنْ قَرَعَ الْقُرْآنَ وَهُوْ قَعْمْ فِي الصَّلَاةِ Whoever recites the Qur'an while he's standing in prayer, كَانْ لَهُ بِكُلِّ حَرْفٍ مِيَةُ حَسَنًا he will have with every letter, he recites 100 good deeds. He will receive 100 good deeds. And whoever recites the Qur'an while he's sitting in prayer, that he's unable to stand for some reason, or he's taken the dispensation of sitting in a nafila prayer. Every letter he recites, he'll receive 50 good deeds. وَمَنْ قَرَعُ فِي غَيْرِ الصَّلَاةِ وَهُوْ عَلَى وُضُوْ Whoever recites the Qur'an outside of prayer, but while in a state of wudu, ritual purity, فَخَمْسٌ وَعِشْرُونَ فَخَمْسٌ وَعِشْرُونَ حَسَنَةً He will receive 25 good deeds for every letter he recites. وَمَنْ قَرَعُهُ عَلَى غَيْرِ وُضُوْ فَعَشْرُ حَسَنَاتٍ And whoever recites the Qur'an without wudu will still receive 10 good deeds for every letter that they recite. وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْقِيَامِ بِالْلَيْلِ فَهُوْ أَفْضَلُ And then if you want an even greater dimension to that, you should pray at night. If you're doing this all at night, it's even 
greater. Why? Because the your heart in the middle of the night is less distracted. And during the day, this is a time of our livelihood. We have people calling us. We have things that we have to tend to. We have business. We have all these things going on. Yes, we might be able to sneak away for short periods of time. But at night, hopefully it's still. And we are less distracted so that we can focus more. So that's even an added dimension. So that if it could, we could be standing in prayer in a masjid at night, that's even better. And then he says, قال أبو ذر الغفاري رضي الله عنه إن كثرة السجود بالنهار وإن أطول القيام بالليل. And what he means by this is, is that uh, that prostrating more by day is what we should be doing in standing longer in prayer at night. And either way, we still want to bring worship into our days and to also have them in our nights. But we as believers should work on ourselves so that night doesn't fall every night. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us like this. Because this is the way the righteous are. Night doesn't fall and come except that we are longing to stand before our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala in prayer. And what a blessed opportunity you and I all have in the month of Ramadan. For 29 or 30 straight nights, we can stand in prayer before Allah Ta'ala and to hear the Qur'an recited. And even though many of us aren't able to do it in a masjid, we can still pray at home. We can still pray behind someone else at home. And outside of Tarawih, we can also listen to the recitation of the great reciters. What a blessed opportunity in this month. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us tawfiq and to bless us with all of these different etiquettes of the state of the one reciting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's book. And may we observe the utmost etiquette inwardly and outwardly. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us all great openings and to fill our hearts with the love of his book subhanahu wa ta'ala. Attach our hearts to his book subhanahu wa ta'ala and open up the meanings of his book to us. And may Allah ta'ala purify our hearts so that we have access to its meanings in every year that passes and every Ramadan that comes. And when you experience many, many Ramadans before we meet our Lord, may we have an increased understanding of his book. في خير و الفعافية وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والحمد لله رب العالمين